Good evening. On behalf of John Jay College of Criminal Justice of the City University of New York and Columbia University's Institute for Latin American Studies, Cuba program, I want to welcome you all and a special thank you to the people who helped here at John Jay to set this evening up. It's been emitted as a webinar from Columbia University, and we're doing a live, obviously, event here, and that's being videotaped here. So we have a lot of technical coordination to do before we started today. So thank you for your patience, as a matter of fact. And particularly, we want to thank Dan Stageman, Director of Research at John Jay College of Criminal Justice and Remy Bahati of that same office for all of their efforts, as well as Ben Lapidus, who uh, really went beyond and above. And we have uh, our technical guru up at Columbia, Astrid Liden, who's been working on this for some time. So thanks to Astrid too. We also have some co-sponsors the Center for Latin America and Caribbean Studies at New York University, the Cultural Connections, which is a NGO that is not very far from here that focuses on high school and university students obtaining basic information and all sorts of cultural events for students from around the world. And we also want to thank the Cuba Foundation. But now we're going to get to the meat of the matter, namely an exploration of trends in Cuban music, and including their, the impact of Cuban musicians and Cuban composers on US music, including jazz, salsa, and a variety of other things. And to explore that very interesting realm we have tonight two of not only New York's finest, but also the US finest, Christopher Washburn and Ben Lapidus. Chris is a professor of music and chair of the music department at Columbia University and the founder of the Columbia University's Louis Armstrong Jazz Performance Program. He has published numerous articles on jazz, Latin jazz, and salsa. His books include Bad Music, The Music We Love to Hate, Sounding Salsa, Performing Latin Music in New York, and Latin Jazz, The Other Jazz. As a trombonist, he has performed on over 150 records with two of them Grammy winners and seven Grammy nominators. He was voted a rising star of the trombone numerous times in the annual Downbeat Critics Poll. He has performed with so many people, I can't name them all. I'll just mention a couple. Tito Puente, Celia Cruz, Eddie Palmeri, Muhal Richard, et cetera, et cetera. And in addition, he has two or three groups that he directs, one of which is the highly acclaimed Ciotos Latin Jazz Band and Fear, which is another, and the Rags and Roots Jazz Band. He has a doctorate in ethnomusicology from Columbia University. And if you Google him, you'll find out a lot more. Ben Lapidus, is a scholar, educator, composer, arranger, and Grammy-nominated musician who has performed and recorded uh, particularly about the Cuban trace, as well as the Puerto Rican cuatro. He also plays the guitar, teaches voice, and other instruments, and has done film soundtracks and done a lot of Latin music and jazz. Some of the musicians that he's played with uh, are Pio Leva, 
Manuel Puntillita Alcea, Bobby Cacases, boy, it's really stretching me tonight, as well as Pio, uh, well, let's see, Cachito Lopez, Juan Pablo Torres, et cetera. Um, and in addition to all of that, he's a professor here at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, as well as the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. He teaches popular music of the Caribbean, guitar, world music, and other courses. He has also taught the Cuban trace and guitar in the jazz and contemporary music program at the New School University and given master classes and workshops on Caribbean music throughout the world. Lapidus served as a scholar in residence for Cuba programs at the Jewish Museum of New York and the New York Center for Jungian Studies from 2004 to 16. He completed his doctorate in ethnomusicology at the Cooney Graduate Center in 2002 and has since published the first ever book on Cuban and Puerto Rican music, um, particularly focusing on uh, indigenous music in those two countries. In addition, he has a wide range of local and national grants for his research, which helped produce the book in 2021, New York and the International Sound of Latin Music from 1940 to 1990. And I think he has a book come out right now or a little while ago, no? Okay, he'll tell you more about it. Okay, we're gonna start with Chris Washburn from Columbia University. Chris. Thank you very much and welcome. Let me uh, send you some technical things. Get rid of me. Yeah. Yeah. Got to turn that off now. That it always right? happens. <laughs> you have to mute the this. Yeah, yeah I'm muted. You muted. Yeah. Okay, now we're done. Okay. Apologize to any of you that are. Experiencing Zoom PTSD right now. Louder. All right, hold on here. All right. It's so nice to see some friendly faces that I haven't seen for a while. And uh, thank you so much for coming. And Meg, thanks for the invitation uh, to be here and Ben for all of the organization. I um, was asked to give a presentation on the current trends of Cuban music. And I'm going to speak about some of the ideas that came out in my recent book, Latin Jazz, The Other Jazz. Um, but I'm going to start, I think, in a bit of an unconventional way. Because I was trying to think to myself, if I have to talk about what are the current trends of Cuban music, I think that this video captures it better than anything else. You may be familiar with this video. Um, you probably are 
would not necessarily associate it with Cuban music, but for those of you that are hip to Cuban music, you might pick up on some things. We're gonna, I'm gonna play it, but I'm gonna stop at some very, I think, uh, important moments that I will come back to and talk about. Well, let's hope this works. The change. This may not work. Hold on. Should work. Was working before. Nope. Yeah. Yeah, hold on. Let's see. Closed my mouth nope. more. No. Nope. Tried. Refresh. I don't think so, but I'll try it. I'll try anything. What causes sensitive teeth? You don't have to listen to the Did app. you know that the two leading causes are irritated gums and weak enamel? Switch to new Sensodyne Sensitivity Gum and Enamel. Helps take care of three problems in just one toothpaste. Yeah, but we don't even have audio. Hold that thought. We can hear everything great on Zoom.
All right. As they say in the music business, one more time. One more once. Yeah. Hold on. All right. All right, here we go. Let's try this one more time. Get the volume up. I tried to change. Closed my mouth more. Tried to be softer, prettier, less awake. Fasted for 60 days, wore white, abstained from mirrors, abstained from sex, slowly did not speak another word. In that time, my hair, I grew past my ankles. I slept on a mat on a floor. I swallowed a sword. I levitated, went to the basement, confessed my sins and was baptized in a river got on my knees and said amen and said I mean. I whipped my own back and asked for dominion at your feet. I threw myself into a volcano. I drank the blood and drank the wine. I sat alone and begged and bent at the waist for God. I crossed myself and thought I saw the devil. I grew thick in skin on my feet. I bathed in bleach and plugged my menses with pages from the holy book, but still inside me coiled deep was the need to know. Are you cheating on me? Are you cheating on me? Keep that image in your mind for a moment and we'll continue. Pay attention to the percussion accompaniment. They don't love you like I love you. Slow down, they don't love you like I love you. Back up, they don't love you like I love you. Step down, they don't love you like I love you. Let me guide your listening. You can't you see there's no other man above you? What a wicked way to treat the girl that loves you. Oh love, they don't love you like I love you. Oh down, they don't love you like I love you. Something don't feel right because it ain't right, especially coming up after midnight. I smell your secrets, and I'm not too perfect to ever feel this worthless. How did it come down to this? Scrolling through your call list. I don't wanna lose my pride, but I'ma fuck me up a bitch. Know that I kept it sexy, and know I kept it fun. There's something that I'm missing, maybe my head for one. What's worst? Looking jealous or crazy? Jealous or crazy? Or like being walked all over lately, walked all over lately, I'd rather be crazy. Hold up, they don't love you like I love you. Slow down, they don't love you like I love you. Back up, they don't love you like I love you. Step down, they don't love you like I love you. Can't you see there's no other man above you? What a wicked way to treat the girl that loves you. Hold up, they don't love you like I love you. Slow down. They don't love you like I love you. Let's imagine for a moment that you never made a name for yourself. A master wealth, they had you labeled as a king. Never made it out the cage to lock that moving in them streets. Never had the baddest woman in the game up in your sheets. Would they be down to ride now? They used to hide from your lie to you. Look at the background. Child, no, we were made for each other, so I find you and hold you down. Missing, say, hold up, they don't love you like I love you. Slow down, they don't love you like I love you. Back up, they don't love you like I love you. Step down, they don't love you like I love you. 
Can't you see there's no other man above you? What a wicked way to treat the girl that loves you. Hold up, they don't love you like I love you. Slow down, they don't love you like I love you. It's such a shame you let this good love go to waste. I always keep the top tier, five star. Sexy loving in the car, like make that wood, like make that wood. Holly like a boulevard. What's worse, looking jealous or crazy, jealous and crazy. Or like being walked all over lately, walked all over lately. I'd rather be crazy. Look at the background. I'll stop it there. This is just one of hundreds of videos that I could have started this lecture with. What are the newest trends in Cuban music? They are absolutely at the absolute center of popular music production in the world right now. How did we get here? For those of you unfamiliar with some of the things that I pointed out, what's interesting, interesting about Beyonce is she's an historicist. She's a revisionist. She, she pays very special attention to very special attention to where the music comes from and the roots, and she makes sure that she pays a tribute to that. The beginning of this video is, hold on, why is this going? There we go. The beginning of this video is really an initiation, it, it references initiation rites into spiritual practices, sometimes known as Santeria, they're derived from West African traditions, they're syncretic religions that emerged in the colonial period throughout the Caribbean and Cuba as well, and have been imported into uh, this country. When she emerges from that ceremony, she comes out dressed in gold, beautiful, around water, when she's actually, you can tell this, this that they want to make sure that you understand that we are no longer in just the mundane world, we're in the spiritual realm, because how does it happen that she uses a baseball bat and then fire explodes? Supernatural powers. Of course, this is reference to a deity known for beauty, Oshun, and is thought to be so beautiful that everybody that lays eyes on her falls in love. She's a deity that you praise to for fertility and for love, and also represents probably a very early feminist perspective of the world. And of course, Beyonce represents that in the, the popular realm. Just to make sure that you get those references though, what she does is she undergirds this entire performance with bongos, a West African instrument that's very central in Cuban son traditions and in salsa and mambo and cha-cha and many of the other ones um, that are, it's so important as an essential so sonic uh, marker of Afro-Cuban traditions. The background track is in clave, clave, the rhythm, the rhythmic organizing principle of Afro-Cuban music. In other words, she has organized all of the musical components around this and around this manifestation of a deity. Of course, this is popular music and the initiation rites was just to figure out if someone was cheating on her. So it's about love, which is normal, but she's also rooting her practices in this long history this in colonial encounter that we're all implicated in in one way or another, but it's also a long legacy of Cuban music being completely centered in popular culture. And it goes way back, we can trace it way back. In my book, the reason why I call Latin jazz the other jazz is because that component of Latin jazz tends to be erased from the historical record. And my book is a revisionist look at the history of jazz. And I trace the birth of it back into the early 1600s. It predates jazz as we know it. If you want to know more about that, please buy the book and buy it in bulk. But, <laughs> but that being said, now the plug's gone, um, I want to kind of reveal some of the things that I found in, um, in, in the research of my book that explains this. And it also explains Bad Bunny. Like, how is it possible that Bad Bunny can be on the top of the Billboard 200 charts with songs that are in Spanish and they're the number one songs in the United States? Truly remarkable. 
Not really. It's happened before. History repeats itself. It's wonderful that it happened, no matter what you think of Bad Bunny. But we could also look at the music of Mark Anthony, his song Need to Know as a guajira and played with violins. It's a charanga and it's popular music. It's on all sorts of AM radio stations now. It's even, it's seeped into all of the cracks and crevices in the United States. Our pop stars today are playing Cuban music. Now, let me get my PowerPoint that disappeared up. So we can look at some images. This was an advertisement that I found from the New York Times in 1917. Evan Christopher was the one that helped me find this. It's for a venue that's right near here, Reisenheimer's Columbus Circle. As a matter of fact, it's a building and a club, a music club, that's where Jazz at Lincoln Center is right now. Today, an entire novelty, seance tea dances. There's a medium of, of gypsies, uh, of dances of the Orient. Gypsy crystal gazers are there. And the original jazz, da jazz dance and Cuban danson will be played. 1917, Cuban danson played in Midtown. What does that mean for white people? These were all white venues. If you go, Ouija boards will be provided. In the most, America's most beautiful ballroom, the Paradise Ballroom. And then if you look down at which band was playing the original jazz dance and the dance songs, it's the original Dixieland jazz band, the very first jazz band from New Orleans to ever be recorded. They were a bunch of white guys that were mimicking the black music styles in New Orleans, very good musicians, and they were very they were central in diffusing uh, jazz and popularizing jazz, especially among white audiences. They never recorded a dance song. They only recorded early jazz pieces, um, typically derived from the black pra uh, practices in New Orleans. But when they came to New York City, they were playing dance song. Why? Because dance song was extremely popular amongst New Orleans audiences in the late 1800s and early 1900s. They were playing the popular music of the day, Cuban music, along with another, a lot of other things, but that was central. It was one of the newest dances. And we start to see that this history, if we look at recorded history throughout the 20th century, time and time again, people turn to the island of Cuba for the newest dance crazes. Many of you know this history, aren't familiar with it. Some of you may not. I was not familiar with the original Dixieland jazz band playing dance songs. Why? Because the recorded record doesn't have any proof. Because when they went into the recording studio, they didn't want to have a white jazz band playing Cuban music. Even the black bands of the day, when they started to do recording in the early 1920s, rarely played Cuban dance song. But if we can look at that advertisement, we can see that the white audiences were prizing otherness. They were prizing novelty, the exotic. And this music served a purpose because it was the music of the other and it was very popular. And indeed, we see these practices, if you can think about Josephine Baker in Paris as well, presenting otherness to those audiences. It was something that was in vogue in art circles with primitivism and primitive art, but it was also a key component for allowing people to have a more worldly experience by experiencing the other. It was what was going on with Duke Ellington in New York City playing at the Cotton Club, staging otherness, staging blackness, staging primitiveness. But these musicians were using these um, strategies in order to expand their audiences. 
If Cuban Danson was being played in 1917 in New York, it's because it was being played in New Orleans a lot earlier. And we see a lot of the early New Orleans jazz innovators giving a nod to that influence of Cuban music. Jelly Roll Morton, a pianist, a Creole pianist from New Orleans, was famous for talking about the Spanish tinge, to have the appropriate feel in jazz, for jazz. What was he referring to? Typically Afro-Cuban rhythms that were inserted into the rhythms of New Orleans. Throughout the colonial period, New Orleans was one of the northernmost Caribbean cities, administered by the Spanish and the French. For those of you who visited New Orleans, the food tastes different, the music sounds different, the people talk differently. It's a different cultural practice that happened there. It's also the place that Congo Square was able to exist and proliferate some of these traditions. It wasn't only Jelly Roll Morton that was talking about a Spanish tinge and when using Spanish at the time in the 1930s when he was uh, when he came up with this quote, he was referring to the Spanish speaking Caribbean cultures and musical cultures. We also see in the next kind of iteration looking for dance crazes, it was this gentleman that also played in Midtown, not far from here, Don Aspiano, Aspiazo and his Havana Casino Orchestra. He was a band leader that was very popular among the casinos and playing for tourists in the, uh, in the, in the hotels and casinos in Havana. He came up to New York to perform in Spanish Harlem and was heard by the RCA Victor executives in the early 1930s. And they saw someone that they could use that was familiar with musical translation. If Danson was so popular in the 19 teens, what could we get that could replace it in the 1930s? This is the press shot that they set up for Don Aspiaso in 1931. If you can see that, he's a good looking guy. He also happens to be a light skinned Cuban, which helped at that point. Not too other, just a little other, dressed in one of those Mambo shirts that I used to have to wear when I played with the Xavier Cougat band, which I leave out of my bio. And um, so dressed in that kind of traditional uh, son uh, garb, but then also surrounded by aspects of exotica and otherness. We can look now at this picture and you can see that those are just percussion instruments that we're quite accustomed to. But in 1930, they weren't available for sale. It wasn't until the Gretsch company started to mass produce them after the success of bands like Don Aspiasu. Bongos at his feet, timbales, there's a guiro, there's even a jawbone along with maracas, and he's holding a set of claves like there's some Cuban cigars. These are the instruments that made the music sound other. The only thing is, is that Don Aspiasu's band was totally influenced by the Fletcher Henderson band, which was the number one the most popular jazz band in the 1920s. Here's a picture of them. It's a little small, but that you can see. Actually, there's saxophones, there's trumpets, trombones, violins, a string bass, piano, all of the type of instruments that you would see in Fletcher Henderson's band. He just mimicked it, the three saxophones that doubled, and there's three clarinets there as well, and, and a tuba in the back. But then, of course, and a banjo on the floor. But if you look closer at this, all of those percussionists, those percussion instruments are there as well. Recorded in 1930, I'd like to play, I think you, a lot of you probably know this song, It was a song that was familiar to audiences in the United States because it had been recorded by Marianne Sunshine a few years earlier, and the, the, the lyrics had been translated. And uh, it's something called El Manicero or the Peanut Vendor. So it was very popular amongst audiences. Don Aspiasu came up and they performed it in, 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 in uh, Harlem and the RCA Victor uh, executive said, you know that, we know that song, we could bring them to Midtown and we could play for white audiences as well. 
and what could happen is um, we'll have them play this song and some of their other songs, and uh, we'll see how popular it is. Let me just play that song for you so that uh, you get it in your ear. This, so this is, this is a recording from 1930. Now, what's remarkable about this is that if you look carefully at this band, see if I can get it a little bigger. There we go. And maybe with that slightly green tinge, you can you can see that there's something quite remarkable that in 1930, these guys were playing in the fifth in the 50s in Midtown for a bunch of white audiences. You're looking at the first racially integrated band that appeared in New York City on a on a stage anywhere. This would have been illegal at that time. Now, the jam sessions after hours in Harlem was a different story. They were integrated prior to that, and some of the recording sessions were actually integrated, but not in the white, ve in, in the white venues. Don Aspiasso was one of the first Cuban band leaders to integrate from and, and use street elements in his band. And so he was really uh, an innovator and on the cutting edge of breaking down these racial barriers. And he brought it to New York, but because New York, New York and the United States at that time had a conception of race of being black and white. When asked about this, he would say everybody in my band is Cuban. And what do they do with that that racial binary when all of a sudden the definition is Cuban as opposed to black or white. He was on the forefront of racial integration and it started right near here in this neighborhood. At the same time, the song that we just played, the English translation for these lyrics are a lovely merry maid in Cuba is waiting for her lover to bring her some peanuts. And the peanut vendor, vendor is really a song pregon, which is a type of genre that's based off the of street vendor calls. That Moses Simone wrote in the 1920s while living, and he's a Cuban uh, composer, while living in Spain, writing for a venue of Spanish audiences to present otherness and exotica from the Caribbean. He, bring, but he brings it here. The only thing is, is that nobody in that audience understood Spanish or they took Spanish in high school. Because this song is not about a merry little maid in Cuba waiting for peanuts. I can give you a rough translation. Hey, baby, I got a hot cone of peanuts for you, and you need to eat that every single night. This was an X-rated illicit song. RCA Victor recorded it. They didn't even know what the genre was. They just said they'd heard that it was rumba was a popular genre in Cuba. They even misspelled rumba and used it as an A, put an H in it, and launched a huge dance craze across the United States and into Europe, which was called the rumba dance craze. It pissed off the Cubans uh, that couldn't believe that this genre was, was mislabeled. And not only that, they recorded this record and it became the number one hit record of 1930 and 1931. Within seven months, Louis Armstrong had recorded it, Duke Ellington had recorded it, Red Nichols had recorded it. It's like the equivalent of a gazillion downloads today. And people complain about reggaeton being X-rated or dancehall. Ain't nothing new. 
Cuba, number one hit song. Also, they introduced slack lyrics into the popular realm way before anybody else was doing it. If they had known what it was about, it would have never gotten recorded at that time. Beyonce is just in this tradition. Of course, in the 1930s, the whole notion of West African syncretic religions was not able to be out revealed outwardly in a lot of different places in, in the Caribbean and also in the United States. Until the 1940s, and we start to see other musicians come in and innovate and also become extremely popular. And one great example is Machito. Frank Grillo is the band leader and singer. Mario Balzat is his musical director. They launch a band and they call it in the, in, in, in the early 1940s, Machito and his Afro-Cubans. This was extremely revolutionary in the sense that that Afro prefix was actually used in a band's name. What they were doing, though, was just embracing the Afro-Cubanismo of Fernando Ortiz, that idea of looking to the West African roots of Cuban culture and acknowledging it, acknowledging it publicly and using it to define Cuban culture. It is completely in, in line with the writings that were happening in, in so many of the nations throughout the Caribbean and also Marcus Garvey's idea, some of the ideas behind the Harlem Renaissance. Machito and Mario Bauza come to New York City. Mario Bauza first arrives with Don Aspiasso as his trumpet player and walks the streets of Harlem and says, this is such a wonderful place to be, not to experience the kind of racism that I have to experience working in Havana. I want to stay. And he did stay and worked with many of the great jazz bands and was key to kind of combining jazz and Afro-Cuban styles in the Machito band, where many people say this is the birth of Latin jazz, the true birth of Latin jazz. But what they also did is that they played in Harlem for black audiences so much so and they were extremely popular this was another place where black culture in the u.s come together with with cuban culture as a matter of fact at the apollo theater machito played there more times than the duke ellington orchestra and the count basie orchestra combined and this was the premier venue for black performance styles it was the place where black culture black harlem came together um, and to celebrate the greatest acts in the world. And Machito was a regular there. So were many of the other artists that have come to really represent the cutting edge voices of Latin music in New York City. Eddie Palmieri credits Amateur Night at the Apollo as his professional launching pad. He went there with a small Latin jazz uh, uh, group, a quintet. They didn't win Amateur Night. They were like one of the runners up and he said, we want a wallet but that's where he went for his start. When people talk about it as the premier black stage, absolutely it was, but what is the definition of blackness here? It's a diasporic blackness and Cuba plays a center of that. Also, if we think about the Machito Orchestra in the 1940s, publicly announcing pride in their African heritage, that is something quite revolutionary that many of the African Americans in Harlem were just starting to grapple with as uh, the Congress for Racial Equality was just getting started and the Civil Rights Movement was really getting started. They were central in, 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 in pushing forth pride in this identity. I want to play just uh, one of their theme songs for a while called Tanga, but I want you to listen very carefully right at the beginning of this song. That's what I want you to hear. Back again, listen carefully. That's not Spanish. That's Yoruba, and that's a praise in Santeria to the deities or a greeting. From the 1940s, Machito was 
acknowledging those roots, Beyonce is just doing the same. And from that, and most people in that audience would not know what that, that those words meant at the beginning of that song. Tanga, by, by the way, is means marijuana in, they say, in a West African language. We don't know which one it is, maybe Yoruba. And, um, and then if we listen after that, there's very little lyrics in this. It's basically uh, uh, Machido is going. And, but for the most part, you hear this connection with Afro-Cuban rhythms and jazz. So a lot of soloing over these grooves. So it's the blues on top of the Cuban rhythms. Chito was on the forefront of the mambo dance craze, which would be the next dance craze that comes along after the conga and then the cha-cha would follow. Again and again, we get these reiterations of popular dances coming from Cuba. How people are moving, how people are using their bodies to interact on the dance floor. We continue into the jazz world and we get Dizzy Gillespie and Chano Pozo. Dizzy Gillespie, one of the biggest jazz stars, innovating with a very important percussionist in Cuba to create different amalgamations of the same type of thing that Machido was using. So why do I bring these various folks up in this talk about current trends? This is the groundwork that was laid for what would emerge and finally be realized in the late 20th century and early 21st centuries and why Cuba has become so centered. I teach a class in, uh, at Columbia University as a Caribbean music, introduction to Caribbean music. It's a large lecture. It's the biggest lecture um, class in the history of Columbia University. It has over 400 students in it. And what I do is I make them to go out and see music and write about concert reports, interview musicians, talk about their experiences. When I first started teaching this class about 20 years ago, 22 years ago, the students would go out and hear salsa bands. There were so many of them performing. They would hear Haitian compa bands they would hear Jamaican reggae bands and be able to write in a wide range of types of practices. What they didn't hear were Cuban bands. There were very few Cuban bands playing. It wasn't until fairly recently, after the Buena Vista Social Club, another iteration of a discovery of otherness that shows up at, the, uh, up, up at uh, Carnegie Hall where we start to see a transformation once again of Cuban styles and Cuban performances. This semester, as my students were writing, when they were, went to find various Caribbean music, every night of the week, they could find Cuban music played in New York City. Once or twice a month, they could find Jamaican music. Rarely could they find Haitian music. The Caribbean music that is played the most, it's not Puerto Rican salsa either. Once a week to find those salsa bands playing, they were so active before, but it's Cuban music, oftentimes in small song groups playing at restaurants very near here in this neighborhood. When we think about the history of jazz and how all of this is related, to sum all of this up, oftentimes we think of a tree with branches and roots. This was painted by Herbie Mann. It's the, Lat the Latin jazz family of a tree as seen by Herbie Mann. If you look closer 
up on the screen, you probably can't see that in this, in this room unless you have uh, amazing eyes. You'll see Pacheco and Eddie Palmieri and Charlie pa uh, Palmieri Fajardo, but you'll see Billy Taylor and Tito Puente. Now you won't see anything. And then, <laughs> and you'll see, but it'll come back, I promise you. And you'll see um, Bossa Nova and Samba in Brazil. But the thing is, is then you just have one trunk and you have Spain, Africa, and Portugal. That's, uh, that's Herbie Mann's perspective of this. And this is quite flawed, but we oftentimes see these manifestations of how of interrelatedness. But I think there's something much more interesting going on in the history of music. I wouldn't create a Latin jazz tree. I wouldn't even create a jazz tree, but I would create a musical tree, a musical tree of the US, of the world. And it looks more like this. It looks like an aspen forest. And what's remarkable about an aspen forest is its root system. When you see an aspen forest, you will see miles and miles of trees, but it is only one organism because all of the roots are connected. Beyonce is connected to Machito, is connected to Chana Pozo, is connected to Mario Bauza, is connected to um, Don Aspiasso, is connected to the original Dixieland jazz band. And she even flashes you a New Orleans funeral band walking behind her out of the blue. Why? To pay tribute to New Orleans as the centrality, the central node from which this aspirin forest grows in the United States. Now I think you're going to hear about some more recent trends in Cuban music. Thank you. Chris, are you, are you muted? Oh, muted. muted. All right, let's see. Hello, hello, hello. Okay, let's see here. Yeah, yeah, I will. Let me just uh, let me just get out of here for one second. Okay, uh, it's sort of hard to tell who can see me and who can't uh, looking at the screen, so I apologize if uh, you can't see my face completely. Um, and I promise I'm going to be talking about uh, current trends in Cuban music, but I would was hoping to uh, you'll indulge me uh, for one moment uh, since uh, today is actually a Holocaust Remembrance day, I'd like to share a couple of brief images from a 1939 um, newsreel of the St. Louis. 
which was a ship that um, sailed from Hamburg, Germany to Havana and was ultimately uh, turned away. Um, and uh, when they got, when they first got to Cuba, there was a uh, sort of a uh, anti-Semitic sentiment in um, in Havana. There was uh, an anti-Semitic rally on May 8th of 1939. The thought was that Jewish refugees would bring uh, communism and steal Cuban jobs, something that we uh, hear to this day um, that could be applied to any group. And uh, I'm, I'm bringing this up because I think it's it's pertinent for uh, where, where we are in the uh, in the world history right now. Only 28 of the 937 passengers were allowed to stay in Cuba. One man tried to commit suicide and jumped overboard, but was allowed to recover and also stay in Cuba. The rest were sent back to Antwerp, uh, but ultimately um, 254 passengers met their deaths in concentration camps. So just some uh, something to uh, consider briefly as we uh, embark on this discussion. 900 wandering Jews have found a haven at last. They crossed from Hamburg to Cuba, but in Havana they were refused entry and had to return to Europe and possibly to Hamburg, the city they dreaded. In every harbor, friends come out to give them words of cheer and sympathy, while they appeal by radio to the democracies. Eventually they're allowed to land in Holland, when some will go to Belgium and France, and others to England. So at last the wanderers find rest in lands which cherish freedom. So, back to Cuban music. The first thing to say unequivocally about Cuban music today is that it is alive and well and thriving. Um, to say otherwise would be uh, an abject lie. And while there are lots of new developments, developments in Cuban music concerning popular taste and popular culture, there's most definitely a continuation with a lot of the ideas that Chris was talking about. Um, a connection and even a dialogue, I would say, with the past, the present and the future. So we honestly don't have enough time to talk about every single development, but I want to point out a few things I think will hopefully stimulate a good discussion and perhaps good future event planning. And the first thing, ironically, to talk about is technology, because we've been suffering at the hands of technology this evening. At all stages of Cuban music, Cuban music uh, has always discussed current events and also technology and its use within Cuba. Cuban composers and musicians have used creative means to describe and use technology. Let's consider the classic bolero by Eusebio Delfin Figueroa, which is called Y tu que has hecho, classic bolero. It was first recorded in 1925. The narrative talks about a girl who has carved her name into a tree trunk. The tree gives the girl one of its flowers, but she has only wounded him and forgotten him. There are many more examples like this, but I think this is a uh, the classic, uh, classic thing. And think about this carving into trees. First talked about tree, carving your name into tree, what it be? So think about that. The earliest way to show somebody that you love them was by carving uh, your name uh, into a tree. And uh, here in this current era that we're living in, ooh, we're having some technology issues right here. Okay. In the current era of uh, Facebook, flash memories, WhatsApp, YouTube, um, we have different recourses. Uh, we don't carve our names into trees for the most part. Since the world, uh, worldwide advent of uh, advanced computer technology and wide-ranging levels of access to that technology in Cuba, 
many artists have incorporated these same timeless ideas of y tú que has hecho while updating them for today's world. Alexander Abreu se te olvidó quien soy yo is telling his uh, former love that uh, tú no existes para mí, Graba, grabate eso en la memoria. You don't exist, record or save that in your memory. Is he talking about the uh, flash drive memory? Is he talking about the computer memory? Is he talking about the human memory? It's not sure. But later on in the same song, he says, No sé qué virus te borró la memoria. I don't know what virus wiped your memory clean. And then he later says, to tell you what era it's from, Te voy a mandar un CD con una dedicatoria. I'm going to send you a CD with a dedication. So I have a new CD coming out in a couple of weeks and everybody that I try to give it to tells me, tells me they don't have CD players. So I say, just can I tell me the Spotify link and, and I can relate because we now, you know, it's like, it's like Eusebio Delphine talking about carving into the tree, sending somebody a CD is about the same. This is what it sounds like. Tiempo machacándome la vida, pensando que me querías. Fue ese tiempo que más pudo el interés que el amor que me tenías. ¿Qué importa? Es que por su gusto se muere la muerte, le sabe a gloria. Tú no existes para mí. Grábate eso en la memoria. Aquí se termina quién soy yo. No sé qué virus te borró la memoria. No sé qué virus te borró Pero la, la memoria. Sola y no repite las historias. ¿Qué importa? No importa. Su gusto se muere la muerte. And uh, even uh, newer technology like the DVD gets some play in Cuban music. Uh, and because memorias or flash uh, drives have really played a crucial role in distribution uh, for music and information, right? El paquete in, in Cuban uh, society. Uh, there's another uh, song that uh, came out approximately two years after this called uh, Esa Soy Yo, which is a, a real uh, kind of pro woman song where the singer uh, tells uh, her husband she's going to run things in the house but she's going to still bring him the DVD. Okay. The increasing importance of social media is also reflected in, Cubans mu in, Cuba, in Cuban music today. Emilio Frias, a niño y la verdad, plays with a female, pleads with a female fan not to post a selfie of him in social media. No me, no me la publicas. Esto es para los dos. Don't publish this picture. Don't put it up on the, on the social media. This is just for the two of us. And Alain Perez also tells his interest, uh, his love interest in one of his songs. Um, I don't care how many followers that you have on Instagram. And in another Alain Perez song, he says that he's going to put his life now into molo avion, which means airplane mode. Um, so we can see how technology has really, you know, become baked into a contemporary uh, song. Uh, and finally, uh, Facebook Messenger and WhatsApp are, are still relevant for communicating uh, within Cuba and from uh, between Cuba and beyond Cuba. And in another song I want to play for you, have a singer named Lázaro Borrego who tells uh, his ex-lover basically like, if you want to get in touch with me, you can send me a message in a chat or you can send me a messenger, but don't, but don't call me. So here's El Nino talking about the, uh, the don't publish the photo. Here's 
quieres ver O si quieres seguidores en el Instagram Lo que me interesa son tus ojos Y tu boca Perdido si te beso en la orilla del mar And of course, this is Mola Avion. Great song. Destino a la isla vacilón, hagan el favor de votar. Que se va, que se va, y me quedé sin batería, se me fue la conexión. Here's Lazar Borrego with uh, telling his ex to communicate only with Messenger or WhatsApp. You know, por messenger, por WhatsApp. Easier access to modern recording technology, Wi-Fi, and platforms for sharing large files has facilitated the collaboration between artists based in Cuba and beyond. This is apparent in so many recent recordings that it would take too much time to list them all. Uh, some the most famous ones being uh, Patria Vida, um, which had collaborators both in Cuba and uh, in Miami, and of course, uh, I think of uh, Willie Chirino and uh, Leoni Torres doing that Father's Day song uh, before uh, Leoni uh, came to Miami. And of course, this next video, which I think is absolutely fascinating because it's it's one of many collaborations this band has done. This is Team Live, which is based in Miami. And the thing that's fascinating here is half of this video was filmed in Havana, half of the video was filmed in Miami. And then throughout the last part of the video, they just keep doing cut shots, going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So the song ends, people are kind of having a good time, and there's a rumba, and you see the rumba happening in El Solar in La Habana, and you see the rumba happening in El Solar, if you can call it that, in Miami. Again, this is fascinating. The, it was recorded in, uh, I don't know the precise logistics of recording, if, if Maito Rivera was actually in Miami or he recorded his part in Havana and sent it to Miami, but the idea that you would shoot the video to show that it's kind of one long connected 
things is pretty bold and, and fascinating. Um, in the embrace of YouTube, Twitter, and other uh, digital platforms has also brought about some direct musical and non-musical exchanges between artists in Cuba and those beyond Cuba. And there's no doubt uh, the rise in access te to technology uh, has gone hand in hand with the establishment of social groups among young people, such as Los Mikis and Los Repas, or people who are in interested in la música de reparto, the urban music. Another uh, really fascinating thing that's happening today uh, in, um, in, in this time period is that some of the stuff that Chris was talking about is even more overt than it ever was um, in terms of the, re the representations of uh, religious, uh, Afro-Cuban religious music and Afro-Cuban uh, secular music uh, in terms of the media surrounding music. Um, we can look at this changing from colonial times to the present and, and increasing. But um, there's some great um, examples right now. And uh, I think the ones that I want to show you right now are, they really speak for themselves, but I'll give you a quick, uh, a very quick uh, introduction. The first one is again, El Nino y la Verdad, Emilio uh, Frias, who's, who's uh, an abacua, palero, a santero, um, a, a very beloved singer, an incredible singer, to be honest. And um, this, this video that he, that he has, um, is basically showing, uh, is talking about Ifa, the Bawalaos in um, La Regla de Ocha. This is before the music even starts in the, in the video. They, they are filmed, are, they have this video showing um, a bunch of Bawalaos sitting around eating, talking. Uh, and I think this is pretty incredible. This is the cream of the crop of Cuban musicians who are also all allowed. So this is a dance song, but in the beginning of the song, in the beginning of the video, going out of their way to show the connections on, on many levels um, to, to these religious traditions. Um, here is uh, another song, similarly. This is, uh, this is a, let me see what this is. Okay, this is a song by uh, um, Diane Carrera with uh, La, El Hijo de, de, de Teresa. And this is also a brilliant, uh, a brilliant song because it also includes a lot of uh, liturgical stuff from, from uh, the Orisha tradition here. They're gonna be singing for Ochun in a popular song. This is also not something that's new. It's been happening for a long time, but just the fact that it's so, uh, it's so out front and it's so much the focus of the music is, is really quite incredible when one considers that it wasn't really until 1991 that any religious practice could be practiced out in the open uh, for, for uh, anyone. If you were uh, an Orisha practitioner, if you were Jewish, if you were Catholic, um, there were serious implications uh, uh, if you were outwardly practicing these uh, systems, religious systems, and now this is the mainstream culture uh, in the media, at least. Oh, 
tú. This next piece came out, uh, I think, at one of the most intense moments of moments in the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. This is a, a piece, Asawano, which refers to San Lazaro or Babalu Aye, and again in the uh, Lukumi uh, Yoruba Orisha tradition um, that comes from Yoruba peoples in Cuba. And what's you'll notice, obviously, the purple shirts for San Lazaro, but you'll also see what's cool about this, musically speaking, is not only are they using um, musical ideas from the Lukumi tradition, but also from Palo, from the Congolese um, religious uh, strands. And uh, you'll also see people kind of crawling on the ground, uh, like like as if they're doing promesas for for uh, San Lazaro. Um, this this is this is also you know fascinating on, on so many levels. <laughs> Okay, um, there's a pretty strong, if not straight line between Ignacio Piñero's Moyella No Voya Con Los Santos from the 1920s to Benny More singing Siguaraya in the 40s and Miguelito Cuní singing Rompe Saragüe uh, in the 1950s. All the way back, I mean, all the uh, previously mentioned artists, um, including uh, Alexander Abreu, Jaile Montpié, Maito Rivera, Alain Perez, all of these folks have also been t making recordings that um, are sort of uh, homenajes or homages to the past. Um, and Alexander Abreos, this is something he's been doing, uh, kind of paying tribute, if you will, to uh, artists from the 1980s and 1990s, even more recently. Um, what does it mean to succeed in Cuban music today? Um, well, instructions for up and coming singers are everywhere in today's Cuban music. Like you'll hear uh, El Nino say, para ser cantante hay que nacer. If you want to be a singer, you have to be born a singer. Or tú no eres popular. Like you think you're popular, but you're not popular. And we can extend this music. Also, we can also extend this whole thing to the música de reparto and Cuban hip hop, where rappers are constantly criticizing each other's bars and flows. There's a lot of beef songs between artists, Cuban artists. It seems like every week there's a different rapper beefing with another rapper, and um, and we're watching it all online. You can you can follow every every move. And uh, people are engaging with the uh, artist directly in the comment section. Somebody puts out a song like La Seri La Nina or El Micha or Chocolate MC. And then in the comment section online, you can watch they're getting skewered or they're getting their, um, their props. Um, it, it's, it's really fascinating. This, this didn't used to happen. So the present, most Cuban artists continue to speak about present day conditions in Cuba. Some have overt political messages, some without. But again, I think there's a real connecting through line in Cuban music that extends, say, from 
old la, Bam Bam songs to NG La Banda, La Bruja, Charanga Habanera, Sagamos Un Chain, La Turista de Buena Vista, all the way to uh, Charanga Habanera and uh, Chacal, Gozando en La Habana, which is a popular song from 2012, Pasaporte, Alain Pérez, uh, Me Quedé Sin Luz y Sin Agua, El Niño, El Cambio, and of course, um, this whole phenomenon of Black Lives Matter and um, uh, and what's happening in the United States is, is also something that uh, Cuban artists have uh, been trying to address. This is a, a great track that came out not too long ago um, with uh, Osmer Diaz uh, Baloy and, uh, and Funky and Faraon and, and uh, Michael Osorbo. But it mentions George, George Floyd and Black Lives Matter. Discrimina y el racista camina por un puente hecho por neuronas cretinas que se empecinan en querer mucho más de lo que miran, negro en la mira. El amo come del esfuerzo del esclavo y el esclavo del esfuerzo de sus propias manos. Estoy seguro que con estos argumentos yo no gano. Soy negro, pero antes de todo soy humano. Y me pregunto lo que no te has preguntado Generalizado por mi raza Envidiado por la masa Cuando conseguimos una buena posición Vivimos en buena casa Tenemos un alto nivel cultural Pero hay quien se molesta viendo negros progresar Es algo lógico que el sol salga para todos Pero a todos no ilumine por igual Negro es el color Negro es el pensamiento Negro es el dolor Negro es el sufrimiento Negro el ADN que heredé de mis ancestros Lo que no tiene colores es valor y el sentimiento Negro es el color, negro el pensamiento Negro es el dolor, negro el sufrimiento Negro el ADN que heredé de mis ancestros Lo que no tiene colores es valor y el sentimiento What doesn't have col uh, color is uh, value and feelings, right? Valor ni sentimiento Powerful statement uh, Other contemporary issues that have come up Especially in the time of the pandemic of course, there were a number of COVID-19 uh, songs. Uh, one, this one was actually controversial um, because uh, El Tosco, uh, Que Descanse en Paz, uh, Jose Luis Cortez uh, made a gesture uh, uh, that's considered uh, an Asian slur. And, um, but the song, uh, the song was popular and tried to make light of, if you will, of the coronavirus, if one could make uh, light of it. Um, now there's still a debate, do we call it timba, do we call it Cuban popular dance music, what do we call it? And then this, 19, uh, this 2019 interview with Amaury Perez on the TV show Con Dos Que Se Quieran, uh, Alexander Abreu defined timba as follows. Timba is simply a mix between pop, jazz, and Cuban music. Either all these beats, pop music or is mixed with the clave and jazz is used to sort of complicate the uh, harmonic cycles. Uh, in other words, a complication enters that becomes more aggressive. It makes the music more aggressive. And then we add popular slang to this, maybe how we speak in Cuba. And as I know, everything that has to do with our local language, and he says that's that's what timba is. But let's hear him say that in his own words. La timba es simplemente eh, una mezcla, una mezcla entre pop, el jazz y la música cubana, o sea, eh, todos estos beats de, 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 la, de la música pop se mezclan con la clave y, y el jazz complica los ciclos armónicos, complica, o sea, entra, en, entra una complicación que, que se hace un producto más agresivo. A esto le agregas eh, eh, el algo popular, o sea, lo que es cómo se habla en Cuba, cómo se... Como, to, todo lo que tiene que ver con, con nuestro idioma local. Sí, sí, sí. sí porque hay un hablar cubano. Hay y un hablar bueno, cubano. sale lo que es la timba. Realmente parecen dos cosas distintas, pero cuando vienes a ver, todo tiene la misma base. 
Sí, y además el mismo fin que es hacer bailar a la gente, ¿no? Eh, o sea, no, no complica, no ha complicado en tu experiencia. Tú, tú tienes músicos, yo conozco a tu orquesta muy bien, por supuesto, y han tocado conmigo muchos de ellos. Pero eh, tú, tú sientes que porque tú complejices la estructura armónica, musical, la gente baila menos o no. ¿verdad? Depende. This is a good part of the interview, and I have to skip over it, but he talks about the necessity of keeping the music simple, and that's why something like Cuban Song is so popular, because sometimes when you try to make things complicated, sometimes it appeals to people, sometimes it doesn't. You can find this on YouTube. It's a great interview. Um, and a great example of him, you know, outright taking jazz, he just did this record about a year ago with, uh, uh, called, uh, um, what is it called? Que todo se acabó. It's a, it's a, it's a playing homage to the music of the 1980s and 90s that he grew up with and that he played. And here he is. I'm going to play this for you. This is Olio as uh, written and performed by Sonny Rollins because he puts it straight into his music. I'm going to show you how. If we look back to recordings from 1959, such as our Senor Rodriguez's tune El Divorcio and Juanito Marquez's 1972 album Marquez, we can hear the use of specific elements, particularly the bass, uh, moving in a way that's going to signal forthcoming changes in Cuban popular music for many, many years to come. I'm going to show this to you really quickly. In the breakdown of the bote section of songs like uh, Charanga Habanera's Lola Lola, or Michael Blanco's Te Escapaste, El Niño La Verdad's Musica Suave, we can, I'm going to show you how this all connects back to the music of the 1950s, but in a, in a way that we're showing this influence of North American music, hip-hop, funk, R&B, it's had a lasting influence on Cuban popular music, but it has also become its own thing. Um, it's been transformed into something new. So here is Arsenio uh, El Divorcio. Check out what the, the tres right here and the bass are doing. It basically goes boom, 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 right? It's a very, it's what you might consider to be proto timba, if you will. Now to further make my case, I've slowed it down 50%.
Now, here is La Candela, 1973, Bamban. Go to 1998. 1998. And this just came out during the uh, 2022. Same concept. Bueno, mira, ya todo el mundo te conoce y todo el mundo lo sabe. Que tú eres música suave, papá. So then we have at least 1959 to 1922, same concept happening in the bass. I'm sure there's examples that precede Arsenio Rodriguez, but that's the earliest one that I can find. And to conclude, while some Cuban musicians continue to move forward back and forth between Cuba, the United States, and elsewhere, Cuban music has definitely increased exposure and is now diffused throughout the world by a variety of digital platforms, streaming services, social media, radio, and other media. As a direct result of this coverage, there has been a notable increase in a kind of musical call and response between Cubans on the island and beyond in the form of songs being directed at specific artists, people, events, or institutions. The music, music videos, and commentaries that have come from these exchanges definitely seem to have a greater presence than in the past due to this new digital age that we're living in. Today's fans of Cuban music can know the details of Chocolate MC's comings and goings, what La Diosa and her family are up to besides her music, uh, the latest tiradera between artists in the musica reparto scene or in the Cuban hip hop scene, as well as which artists have left Cuba, returned to Cuba, and what their latest musical activities are. Today's fan of Cuban music can also watch snippets of concerts and even view some concerts in their entirety on Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter, whether transmitted from the provinces of Cuba, La Habana, Miami, or anywhere else in the world. Prior to the advent of these technologies, it was all Radio Bemba, or word of mouth. Uh, so in many ways, this change is a win-win situation for Cuban music. These platforms also allow for better communication among Cuban musicians and musicians who play Cuban music around the world. These digital platforms facilitate collaborations and the sharing of musical knowledge, particularly older archival recordings of Cuban music that are not easily accessible in Cuba. And this is not limited to Cuban sacred music. Musical groups dedicated to older folkloric and regional styles of music, such as Changui, are also using these platforms and gaining visibility within Cuba and beyond. Folkloric and religious music is also taught using WhatsApp and other venues. This was unthinkable not too long ago. Given these factors, the future of Cuban music is bright and dynamic as it continues to thrive while simultaneously connecting and reconnecting the past with the present. And I'm going to end uh, with a little clip, which I watched myself uh, about maybe six, eight days ago, uh, which is a live transmission from Guantanamo, Cuba. La Loma de Chivo is the Casa de Changui. And they put up this uh, great band, uh, Miki Ki uh, and uh, Roberto Duverge playing bongo. And uh, this was just Facebook. This was not uh, YouTube. Oh, there we go. Getting there, getting there. So 
that's a straight on camera shot of the stage if you were to sit if you're gonna if, if this is if let's say this is la casa de changuina loma de chivo and that's the stage you're sitting exactly this is what it would be like it's not a five camera shoot there's nothing glamorous about it but if you're a fan of the music it's a, it's absolutely amazing it's much easier than taking a few airplanes and buses and so all the other concomitant uh, necessities of traveling to Guantanamo. So uh, that's that's a win-win, I think. So thank you very much. Just a couple more minutes of thank yous. Uh, Thank you. This was an experiment. We learned a lot. Uh, we had two universities cooperating and obviously Ben from John Jay, Chris from Columbia, Chris Washburn from Columbia, and who should join us? Oh, you did, <laughs> okay. Um, and I want to thank all of you who have been both the people who've uh, linked in virtually, as well as the people who are in this room for your patience, et cetera. As I said, when you have two musicians and a historian, uh, you don't always get the best in technology. But I think we uh, uh, did a good job in terms of the richness of the two presentations by Ben and Chris. And I want to thank, uh, John Jay in particular for being so hospitable, et cetera. Uh, Remy Bahati, who uh, tried to uh, do everything, uh, et cetera. And also Astrid Ligden, who's up at Columbia doing the webinar technology. And obviously there's a special thank you to all of you who made the trip to John Jay, even if you were already in the building, or if you had, the, I saw a few people that came all the way down from Columbia University. Amazing, amazing. And even City College, et cetera. So uh, we look forward to seeing you again, um, maybe at a nightclub or jazz club that our experts can recommend. Thank you all for coming and good night. Thank you. Thank you.